It's what, crazy. My, my biggest memory was the the first hole was also the driving range. Driving range, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they I, they definitely changed it from that. I think they changed it from that like around like 2010 before they did the big renovation. So they okay. had to get away from that. Yeah, I remember that too, actually. So okay, yeah, how did they how did they work that? You um, just so, I, I practiced there in college sometimes. Yeah. You just had to like kind of like duck and like watch out and be like, they oh, God, please don't or anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just had to walk it and just yeah, go. It, yeah, it, it was wild. I, it, that, but that lets you know that um, all courses are created equal, you know, for sure. So, um, well, it kind of goes with the, I mean, so we might lose Taylor midway through the podcast probably a couple of times because they don't have fiber optics in Oklahoma yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> She freezes off with so funny get, faces. You will also <laughs> notice that he picks on me the whole entire podcast <laughs> and Oklahoma, which I'm proud to be. I'm but, proud of Oklahoma. Know. Yeah, and I'm, and, I'm a, and I'm a Sooner also. So let's get this thing going. Uh, this is <laughs> um, 32 of the Golf Performance Group podcast. So you probably just heard some um, uh, nice banter. Um, it, we still like each other right now. By the end of the pod, we may not, but you've got um, one of your hosts here, LeBron Palmer. We also have uh, JJ Wood. And Taylor Cusack, who goes by T-Sack. T-Sack. <laughs> and we have a... We have a <laughs> Special guest with us. So, JJ, um, do you mind doing the honors for us, please? Yeah, we got Jimmy Hack. Is that your nickname? <laughs> <It is. laughs> uh, it's actually what I named my company. Was everywhere I've ever lived, they always call me Jimmy Hack. So I go, I'm going to call my company Jimmy Hack Golf. Nice. That's a good nice. one. Yeah. I nice. actually, uh, on SkyTrack, I downloaded a new software to try their golf course software. And the level, like, I'm at the hack right now. So when I play, <laughs> it says JJ Wood Golf Hack. And then like, oh. <laughs> but it's pretty funny. That's yeah, if you're, if you're at the hack level, I, that, they probably wouldn't even want me on it, right? <laughs> yeah. that's where you are. And then I, <laughs> then I couldn't get my first match to work because it's like internet, like a player is somewhere else is playing me. And I couldn't get my ball to track. So I lost my first match. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. Like, I'm, really, I'm really low on the hack totem pole here. So, 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 Jim. Again, thank you so much for um, joining us, and let's let's kind of just jump right into um, what's going on with you, um, how you've positioned yourself now, even during the pandemic. Um, I know that JJ and Tiffany um, work with you on a few things, so maybe we can just kind of just have a conversation about tell us how you got started. One in the golf industry, and then two, how did you come up with this product and the design, etc. So the golf industry was, I, I was a wannabe tour player when I was younger. And after college, actually in college, I was the walk-on at the Arizona State golf team. And I played with Phil Mickelson for a year and a half at ASU and didn't want to leave ASU, but it was tough to break into their top five. So I ended up transferring to Oregon State and I finished up playing for the Beavers for my final two and a half years. Uh, but then after college, I tried to play probably five or eight years professionally didn't get very far, but I met a lot of people and I, and I got a lot more involved in instruction. So when it, when it was making obvious I wasn't going to make it as a tour player, I started teaching and then I became a PGA member. Well, while teaching, I was a very technical guy. I was very, read a lot of books and studied a lot of things, talked to a ton of people, very controlling and technical, almost piece by piece. And I, I was probably hurting more golfers than I was helping at this time because I was so technical and they would get kind of confused by some, some of my stuff. And I was confusing myself at the same time. <laughs> well, what happened was a good friend of mine, one that I played the mini tours with, finally made it to the PGA Tour. And he called me up and he said, hey, Hack, would you like to caddy? I go, yeah, I'd like to see what that world's all about. So I went out and caddied for Patrick Moore, who was the leading money winner on the Nationwide Tour in 2002. So he got his tour card for 2003. I didn't caddy for him on the Nationwide. I just caddied for him on the regular tour. And I joined him in 2003 and had this wonderful opportunity to watch the best golfers in the world just hit balls and play all day, every day. And the guy I worked for was a workaholic. He had a, I don't know if you can see a grip, but he had a very strong grip. And he would, okay. he would just turn his like throttle that hand way over. So at impact, he'd have to almost hang on tight so he wouldn't hit a big old hook. He um, would hit balls two to four hours every day. So Jeez. I had to, yeah, every day. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes before a round on the tour, like 
he would wow. be out there. It was that sounds like what VJ Singh used to do. VJ, <laughs> I, I used to read stories about VJ Singh, and they said he would do something similar, like just a maniac when it came to hitting balls. So yeah, and, and that's what it was. But what what the sad thing for Patrick was, it ended up leading to an injury. He ended hmm. up getting a bulging disc in his neck because his left forearm, his left tricep looked like a bodybuilder and his left forearm was twice as big as his right <laughs> so he was out of balance basically and it led to a neck issue and that's what knocked him off the tour now so all that overwork led to that but what it did for me was i was on the range every day watching him but when you're with somebody for two to four hours on the range you, you start to drift you start to look at other people mm -hmm. So what I started to do was I started to develop this philosophy of the golf swing that was way different than my technical side. It was a rhythm-based situation. So I would pick out the players that I thought had the best rhythm. Like if Freddie Couples was on the range, I'd yeah. park the bag right next to Freddie. If <laughs> uh, uh, Jeff Ogilvie was out there, I would park yeah. the bag next to Jeff and watch him hit balls. So it was watching these guys where I came up with this concept that the golf swing isn't a piece by piece thing. It's a sequence of rhythm back and forth that almost looks like you're swinging a ball on the end of a chain. There's an old medieval weapon called the mace and chain. It's a, it's a wooden handle with a chain and a steel ball. And they kind of go around like this with it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you took that and swung it like a golf club, if you went back about two thirds, you could make it into a perfect golf swing motion. So I thought to myself, well, that's really the idea then that if I could, learn how to do this and then teach this to the students I was working with, it would make it easier for them to learn this athletic motion. So I set out to make something that was like a ball and chain, but not nearly as dangerous as that. <laughs> so, and it was, I made some early ones that were quite dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I saw some of the pictures. <laughs> he, he, he had golfers out there like they were on Game of Thrones for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's a weapon. That's a weapon. <laughs> he needed uh, Taylor's headboard from last week. He was like, Watch <laughs> it. Watch it. She tried, she tried to act like she got into a fancy studio last week. And it was like a wooden Game of Thrones board behind her. I, I had my cute, She's my like, cute I'm top actually on. In bed. Yeah, my cute top on with sweatpants where you guys couldn't tell. <laughs> so, so then from there, that, like, I guess you, how many prototypes did you have before you got to what's almost in everyone's golf bag that I see? I mean, if you're, yeah. it, you know, anywhere that I've been, someone has, you know, what is that again? Or where, you know, someone's <laughs> got it in their golf bag. So how many prototypes uh, did you have before you, uh, and JJ, my bad, go ahead. No, I was going to say, how many times do you walk a range randomly and watch guys warm up with the orange whip incorrectly? Oh, well, that's probably his problem. Yeah. <laughs> too, too, too often, actually, because it's bouncing Does it off. Does drive you nuts? Oh, yeah, yeah. they're just like, phew, yeah. phew. And I'm like, God, you're going to hurt somebody. Like, <laughs> all, I, all I ever do in those instances, I just try to slow them down. I just try to get them to take it easy, find a rhythm to it, and then build up. But, yeah, it kind of drives me a little crazy because it's like, ah, <laughs> yeah. oh, they're just so obnoxious with it. Because yeah. I have to be, I have to be honest. When I before I like you did the when I met you at the coaching summit a year or two ago, um, and I that orange whip drove me nuts because I would just walk up the range and <laughs> I didn't I didn't necessarily know how to correct them because I don't watch like the tutorial videos or anything, and I would just be like, just stop doing that, please. <laughs> like you're just hitting yourself with the orange. Well, whip. And, and imagine that with the mason chain if they were swinging it. That. <laughs> yeah. oh Maybe they would learn not to do it. That's yeah. Funny. <laughs> so what I so what I did was uh, this idea developed in 2003 and four as I was caddying, and it just the more I tried to almost debunk it in my head, the more I realized that I think this was right. So I started to make things in 2006 that would resemble that, but it, I started with a fiberglass rod or like a fishing rod, and okay. I would put weights on the end, each end of it, the counterbalance end, and then the head end. And I didn't know how much weight, so just through trial and error, I would adjust different weights until what I felt felt the best. And probably as far as prototypes, I mean, I bet I made 20 of them. Wow, and, wow. 
And here's a cool thing. I picked out my <laughs> five or six favorite early prototypes, and I have a gun rack at home. There's no guns in it. It's all my oh, original. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how neat. <laughs> that, I, that's a picture I saw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> so, so someone could think that you were just making weapons in there <laughs> instead of golf training age. Yes, that, that makes sense. So, there's, yeah. a, there's a new thing going on Instagram right now, and it's like how it was going, and now it's how it is actually going and you can split the picture on kind of like where you started and now where it's actually at and see the difference that would be really neat that would be see how far you've come yeah i'll I'll do that because i have a lot one thing i am is nostalgic like even notice my headphones i borrowed this hey Uh, they work though (laughs) they work work. you guys are too young to remember walkman's no, no, I, so, I did. Taylor is. So. <laughs> Taylor is too young. Taylor, too young. Taylor, Taylor, lived Taylor in doesn't the even there. remember the iPod. Yeah, she does. Oh, you're she's funny. Like, oh my God, yeah. she, the iPod. she doesn't I remember anything cassette, before Dave. Instagram. Yes, yeah, she's never had a cassette. Stop. Yes, <laughs> I did. Britney Spears and NSYNC were my first cassette tape, okay? CD because I had Britney Spears too. All right, so wait, sorry about the tangent. Let's get back to the tangent. So, what now? You've expanded the product line, of course, from just that original training aid. Kind of tell us how, how you went towards. All right, well, there's more than just this one need. What what other gaps can I fill? And I think it's incredible. Um, you know, in talking to um, JJ and Taylor before, you know. We're, I'm just impressed with how you've been able to take now from you being a caddy and building that into what you've done now. So how how did you determine, okay, well, there's other um, verticals that I can kind of go into with this also. Well, with, with the golf swing or any golf shot, there's, there's a rhythm and there's a sequence to every golf shot, be it a putt, a chip, a full swing. And basically what I think I designed with the orange whip was something that a golfer can feel the sensation of, timing and sequence and rhythm and balance whereas a normal golf club they're so light that you can't always feel what it's doing you we can almost overpower it the orange whip being quite a bit heavier and so flexible if you do it out of sequence it looks like the people jj was talking about on the range it's just <laughs> all over the place so i i started to conclude that there was a better i mean not just a full swing but i could go to short game so my next move was to to the putter And I've always had this idea about putting, mostly because I'm a bad putter, but that with a flat face putter, I always, I would always pull hook every putt I hit. The the flat blade would close down, probably deceleration, and I would pull every putt. So I started thinking, I go, well, in pool, if if pool, if you hit right in the back of a ball, it's going to go the direction of the impact if you dead center it. So I came up with this idea for a training putter that has a round face. The putter isn't flat, it's round. So if you can dead center it and then it will roll the ball directly the way you're swinging, it's a, it's a good transfer of momentum or, or letting the momentum carry it that way. So I added that unique putter head to a flexible shafted, uh, uh, to the orange whip shaft. So you got the same timing and sequence. So it teaches the same rhythm on a smaller scale, but the, f- the focus then is the, the round putter head. Cause if you use that and then you go back to your normal putter, it's going to be so much easier to hit because you're hitting it in the center of the face and getting the best response. So that led me to, to Stan Utley. He was using our putter and I was a chip yipper. I'd get a little nervous around the greens and I could double hit a chip. <laughs> I've done it. Oh. I did probably done it in some bigger tournaments, exactly. but it's, uh, it was always frustrating. So I, I, I started talking with Stan Utley and we became friendly from going to these different teaching summits. And he said, Jimmy, I don't know why you don't put a wedge head on the end of this orange whip shaft because it's everything you talk about and doing your full swing is what should happen in the short game. And he goes, and I've watched you chip and you don't do that in your short game. You're nowhere (laughs) near it. So he, we made one together and it worked out better for his philosophy and, and basically the promotion of the short game. So that came along after the putter to basically kind of fulfill the short game. Now, where the peel comes in, you see the, that's just kind of a wall covering Mm -hmm. for my office, but the orange peel came to me because my, as I was still trying to compete and play at as high a level as I could in our state opens and such, I would tend to slide into impact and hit some high blocks. And they'd still be in the right side of the fairway, but I'd lose distance and they were just kind of slight blocks. So I wanted to figure out a way to, to post up or rotate better, but in center that rotation. 
and I was looking at a painting by uh, Leonardo da Vinci called Vitruvian Man. It's it's the big circle, and there's a guy in there with two sets of arms and legs, and his mm -hmm. feet are on this radius at the bottom. And I thought, wow, if I could stand inside of a bubble and swing a golf club or a baseball bat, for that matter, or even tennis racket, rotation is so much easier inside of a bubble than it would be on a flat surface. So I thought, how do I do this? I don't want to make a whole bubble. So I made something about the size of a boogie board, set it on the ground. It's stable, but it's got a concave surface. So when you stand in it, it naturally centers and balances your core. And because your feet are tilted like this, easier to push off, but also harder to, to move laterally back or through. So I thought of it, it would be kind of a unique thing. So I had a buddy of mine that I met here locally who can create anything. And I said, could you make something like this? And two days later, he had cut one out of some wood and made it perfect. And uh, nice. I tested it. And I was like, man, that was, that was better than I thought. So, wow. yes, yeah, so we've been promoting that for years. But where it's really now finally starting to take off is when we teamed up with Brian Newman, who's a PGA member. And a, he's a golf pro, but he's a fitness guy. So he's, yeah. he's mm -hmm. a combo. And he took the orange peel and he started to add resistance bands to it. And he created this whole workout program around that and the orange rip products and now the new light speed. And his whole deal is how to use your body more efficiently and athletically to create speed, but also for, for a healthier body as well for golf. So it's all been kind of a unique evolution that each year it just kind of slowly grows and hopefully expands into all aspects of the game. Definitely not. We, we, speak that into existence we see it now like um that, that the progression has been incredible and we know it's going to continue to go so taylor or jj anything for um jim before we get into just general um banter here in a moment so anything uh, you know, want to add? Did, taylor did, didn't you just uh get a light speed Taylor, I just you, got a, I just got a whip. No, I didn't get a, I, I didn't get a light speed. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah I, uh, I mean, no, I like now after I met Jim and listened to your presentation, the, I do them like every day, like the drills, I'll make my students do them. Cause like you said, no matter, I mean, I, I'm not smart enough to be too technical like you, but I, I do get <laughs> too technical for people that aren't in golf every day. So like you're, I, you're I, one I, of the most technical people I've, I've worked with. This is coming <laughs> from a defensive lineman. It doesn't matter. You're, you're still football. you're still a technical person. Like you're. <laughs> I am technical. not technical. <laughs> I was self-taught on field, but you have to be. If you're changing a swing position, you're technical. Like it's a technical True. piece. Fair, right? fair. So fair. there's no way to get away from it. And so then I'll like I used to have them get a water, but now I'm like, all right, get a, I'll get the speed radar, give them the light speed, and just have them swing as hard as they can and hold your finish. And then by the end oh, of the no. lesson, they love me because they, like, <laughs> brainwashes them to, like, forget about all the technique. We, and then I'll be like, all right, here's your notes. Work on that later. But don't think about it when you play. So Okay, so I'm, I'm curious. Where, where did you come up with the name? What made you – name it orange whip obviously it's orange and it's whippy but i mean what made you choose that color what's the kind of what's behind sure. that so i knew it was going to be a ball on the end of a stick because if you put a club face on the end of a club then people start to concern on their takeaway where that club yeah. face is at and that's when their elbows start getting all over the place but if you give somebody just a stick and they swing yeah. it their elbows tuck perfectly everything is very natural and athletic so i knew it was going to be a ball I didn't know what color it would be. I knew it would be a vibrant color because I knew it would, you'd see it in front of you swinging. So I thought, you know, it could be lime. It could be yellow. It could be pink. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was I, uh, I was watching the Blues Brothers, another movie you may not be familiar with. but it, <laughs> Taylor, uh, definitely not. Taylor <laughs> definitely has not watched the Blues Brothers. <laughs> and at the very end of the Blues Brothers, they're about to be arrested by John Candy. Yep. And John Candy's sitting there with two other cops, and they're just waiting for the Blues Brothers to come out. So the they're ordering drinks, and John Candy points at the server. Oh, no, he points at one of the cops. He goes, "Orange Whip, Orange Whip, three Orange Whips." And I thought, man, that's an awesome name. It stuck. It was immediate that if I made that ball orange and it's a whipping motion, that's a perfect it name. Works. Yeah. yeah. So that's within, so neat. One sec. Yeah, and you can find it. You could go to YouTube and just type in. Blues Brothers, Orange Whip, and it's a 15-second long clip, and it's where he says, Orange Whip, Orange Whip, three Orange Whips. So it was that moment I knew exactly what it would be, and it never varied after that. I had a bunch of silly names before that that I thought, uh, but when I heard that, I go, that's it. That's the name. 
Nice. So th- cool. your colors have nothing to do with the Oregon State Beavers. Well, no, and uh, yes, they do. Actually, that's exactly right because they are orange and black. They are. Yeah, but here's the thing: I live this office right here. I'm in in Easley, South Carolina, which is outside of Greenville. Yeah, is 12 miles from Clemson University. So all the Tiger fans think it's, and it, and I tell them it is because of Clemson. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really Oregon State. Now Taylor, when you um, you were in South Carolina for the Fox Sports show, right? Um, yes. Didn't y'all do Myrtle Beach and all of those courses? Yes. Yeah, we shot, um, gosh, six or seven episodes going down the Myrtle Beach Golf Trail. We wow. were there for, gosh, three days. And out of those three, we filmed two days straight. It was crazy. It was pretty well, fun. Well, and I work with Jimmy Hanlon quite a bit. He's, yeah. uh, he's a great yeah. dude. I got to know him when he was just uh, doing local Ohio Jimmy yeah. Allen shows and now it's nationwide, but no, he's been a, he's been a great supporter and a great help for us. So I've, uh, I've enjoyed working with him. Oh, All right, so yeah, he's a great guy. <clears throat> we'll definitely come back to make sure that everyone has social media website, all of that in the, in the pods so we can put in the show notes, but I have a bone to pick with some of our listeners and I just want you all to hear it out. I said three weeks ago that it was unfair that Phil Mickelson was playing on the Champions Tour because he was going to win every time. And I've been proven right. <laughs> it is unfair. <laughs> and people, people got in our comments and said, no, 50, 50 is the right age. And I said, it is unfair that he's allowed to play with yeah. guys like you know that that barely playing golf. You're you're golf. just you're that reg, you're that member in the skins game that when the assistant pro plays it makes a birdie. You're like he's not allowed to play even though he's a eight handicap. But he's a pro. Yeah. He's a pro. It is and not like, fair. He, so so give give Jim some background. I I've been complaining that fifty is too young to allow guys like Phil. And then remember, Tiger's going to be there in a few years if he determines he wants to play. He won't. But, but they will oh, never yeah, lose. Will. You don't think he will? I mean. I think he will. He's a competitor, and he's going to get sick of not winning on the PGA Tour. So he wants to win at every level. He's won at juniors, <laughs> regular. Now he's going to beat up on the old people. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Jim, can we get your perspective as a, um, a player, a pro, a person in the golf industry, is 50 too young for the Champions Tour? See, Breon thinks it should be changed to 55. 55. I think, 55. I think they should just align with the USGA, do 50 or 55. Like, well, that, that's about always, two different seniors. Thing. Yeah, that's strange to me because you're right. The amateurs are USGA is 55. I'm, I'm buddy yeah. with Frank Vanna Jr., who's uh, up in New England, and he's a, a tremendous star. But, yeah, he was the one who said, yeah, all of his stuff, you got to be 55, but yet the champion tour is 50. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm 52 right now, so I'm, uh, I'm okay with the 58. Because <laughs> it gives me a chance. But <laughs> I, just, I just feel like the way that Phil, his distance, is is unmatched compared to anybody that's playing out there. Yeah. The- no, what about what about uh, what's the guy that holds out on eighteen from uh, Sweden? Oh, um, hold on, I'll look it up. I know that you're guy's talking about six five. Like he's got to hammer it. Uh, but Phil's also Henry, a little uh, bit different than every other. Phil's you know, also a legend player. too. Like Jack it, Nicholas yeah. when he he started on Champions, he's better than Phil Mickelson. Like, how many times did Jack win? Probably thirty, but yeah. Thank you. So that's what I was saying. It's but Jack won like 50. seventy. Uh, Jack won like I don't know how many on the regular tour. So go ahead, Taylor. What were you saying? You were well, saying I was just going to say like, look how much Phil is in. He's so much better shape than everybody else. Yeah. I mean, he has such Who a better advantage. Who would I ever advantage. thought we would say Phil? <laughs> so much better shape. He has such a better advantage than everybody else. He's worked hard. And, I mean, what what if he was sixty and he was in this kind of shape? So are mm-hmm. we going to ban Bryson because he's going to drive every green at Augusta? No. <laughs> We're going to get to Augusta. Bryson got a lot of play. Like my, or Matthew yeah. Fitzpatrick, did you, did you hear what he said? That yes, Bryson, he did, yeah. yeah. That is such yeah. a poor pouty, I'm it is. and I can't hit a hard statement. Like, <laughs> it is, it is. Like, it come is. on. If it's such an advantage, work hard, hit it for this. Like, he needs to get some of that coffee that Phil's drinking that has to be laced with THC. Because <laughs> Phil is the happiest person <laughs> that I've ever seen in my life. And coffee doesn't do that to you. How was, so, how was Phil at ASU? Because when I, so well, growing <laughs> up, I always heard bad things about Phil. Like, you know, from guys that played on tour. My college coach was a caddy on tour. And so I always, like, 
talk negatively when people would ask me, even though I never met him. And then I met him, and he was like the nicest, most helpful guy in the world. And I was like, why is everybody bashing him? Like he's I like think- my favorite now. Yeah, he was great. I mean, as a, as a teammate and as a buddy. I mean, because we did everything. We had study halls. We had we yeah. party a lot together. I mean, he was he was a fun guy, and a likable guy. Now he was highly competitive, and that probably rubs people the wrong way. Well, yeah, at times, yeah. but yeah. hugely competitive. But the story I tell about Phil that I always think about all the time, and it's wish I, I wish I had more of this in me. I remember playing Arizona Country Club with him, and we both hit it in the right trees, and. As we're walking off the tee, I'm scolding myself. I've got my head down. I'm pissed off. Uh, Phil could not be walking faster to his golf ball. He's just booking it to that to that ball. He can't wait to get to that ball so that he can make birdie from the trees. I mean, he he couldn't wow. wait for it. And I was like walking slow and dragging. Him. I wasn't carrying my bag behind me, dragging on the ground, but it, it felt like that. <laughs> it felt like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> yeah. And he would. Do- I used to do that when I was like saying my bag dragged <laughs> on the ground. Everyone make fun. <laughs> so he I was, refused the pull cart. He was just so optimistic about what he could potentially do. He didn't always pull it off, but he he, he went for it every time. So he, he almost had this optimism I had never seen before. Because even in college golf, you always got the naysayers on the team or they're always getting screwed because they don't get – didn't get to go to that event or whatever, but yeah, man. Phil, Phil, <laughs> <laughs> Phil was always optimistic and he was always supportive. And there was times where he would help you if you needed help on anything. And yeah, he, I, he was great. I'm a big fan of Phil. Yeah. I don't know how much I liked that. Steve Loy was our coach at the time and is now Phil's manager. I don't know how much I like that situation, but what do you do in that exactly. situation? But yeah. Tim, Tim yeah. swallowed in his footsteps, that other coach. Now he's John Rom's manager <laughs> and caddying for uh, Phil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so um, dipping. we've got a couple quick hits before we get out of here. We've got the Zozo Open that would have been in Japan, but it's now at Sherwood because of the pandemic, headlined by Tiger. And I've got some betting that I want to tell you all about. You can let me know your thoughts. All right. And, Jim, and, he's addicted to gambling. Okay. It is not gambling. <laughs> he, he claims that the golf is the easiest it, sport to bet on. So it I'm is like, the easiest is sport to bet on. <laughs> that, that, like, so, Jim, I'll tell you my philosophy on why it's the easiest to bet on. Because courses don't change, only the players. So I can know who is good at Bermuda Greens. I can know who's good at certain places in the country. I can know who plays well because the course has never changed. It's not like um, NBA basketball where a guy could hurt his ankle or something like that. This is pretty standard of knowing who's doing well and who's playing in form right now. So, Have you ever played golf, Brian? I play golf all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, I remember, I, in the tournament of the tier, I was four under through seven and shot 75. Like, I'm not a pro though, so you you can't you can't use me as the example. But I I do want to give you the odds that are out for the Zozo Championship today, and then the bets that I'm putting in. These are all future bets right now because of course the tournament hasn't started. Because again, inside baseball, y'all don't know we're recording this the day of the tournament. So we've got John Rom is a thousand to one to win the tournament. He is the favorite. What do y'all think of that? I'm thinking of sprinkling a little bit on the favorite. What are y'all thoughts? Thousand to one. Yeah, thousand. So basically, it's um, for every hundred dollars that you bet, you win your money back. Essentially, it's a uh, you know. So the thousand. I'm gonna say, why is it so aggressive? Because that's just how they do the odds in Vegas. They'll they make well, them the look like six to one last time he won or something. Six, he was six hundred to one, which basically uh, means so for every hundred that you bet, you are really only winning like sixty. You're only recovering a portion of your money at that point since they're such a strong. So favorite. you can only lose. How do you, you can win lose, money? You lose your whole money. You can lose your whole amount. That's why so. I don't gamble. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to that point, um, John being the favorite, what do y'all think about him being the favorite today in Sherwood? I think mm-hmm. it's uh, a good bet. But I, I, I'm going to go Tiger this week, if you were asking me that. <laughs> I don't know if you are asking me that. I don't think I'm anyone gonna... asked you that. <laughs> I don't know. I just so Jim, Jim, what, do you, what do you think about um, John Rom this week? Well, I think I mean, he's a great player, but here's my, I played Sherwood and I actually even caddied in the, uh, when it used to be the Greg Norman's event way back when, and that's a pretty narrow course. And there's also a lot of trouble or canyons and stuff. So that would be my concern with Rom. If he starts hitting it 
sideways a little bit, but he's a heck of a player. But I, I'm going to probably lean towards somebody who hits a little more. Let's go with Matthew Fitzpatrick if he's playing. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, Fitzpatrick is, Matthew Fitzpatrick is 3,300 to 1. So I'm going to do, do that. So that's good. So, that, could be a, that could be a good course for him. A little, yeah, so for every dollar I bet, every dollar I bet if he wins, I win 33. So that's, that's a good bet to me right that's there. That's awesome. Right. So when, right, when so, was the last time John Ron won? I mean, it's um, been right a while. Before, right before Olympia, the tour championship. Olympia Field okay. to be Dustin and that. Yeah, uh, in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. Contest. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, uh, and then the yep, Tiger, just because he's headlining, 2,800 to 1. So for every dollar I bet, I win 28 if he wins. Is that reasonable odds there? You think he's about middle of the yeah. pack? Middle I of the think pack? Tiger. Yeah, I think Tiger. Tiger's gearing up for Augusta, so I bet he's pretty I agree. Well. Pretty sure. I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But did you guys – I heard on PGA Tour Radio after I heard the Orange Whip commercial – that because uh, <laughs> I pulled it out the other day in a lesson, and uh, one of my students like, man, they're aggressive on PGA Tour radio. I hear about it all the time. I was like, yeah, it's good. You should get one. Uh, you should. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. They probably they're telling everybody to Amazon. No. Go <laughs> get an uh, orange whip right now. That's what we're telling people. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but they were saying Tiger. I don't know how many events he's played there, but I don't know how many more than ten. But he has five wins and five runner ups. Oh, so perfect. Not, wow. So perfect. not many. He's a good choice, yeah. Not many people have beat him at Sherwood. I think Zach Johnson holed out that one year towards the end and That's like right. beat him, like, to get in a playoff maybe and beat him. I don't know. But something miraculous has to happen. Yep. <laughs> so. No, I think Tiger is a great pick actually for Sherwood. And then my last, bet, my last bet that I want to put in, and, and I've been sprinkling a little bit on him recently to like make top 10s and top 20s, and it's been working out. Lanto Griffin. There's something about his game yep. that is so consistent. I, I, and it doesn't matter where he plays. Um, any part of the country, he's a guy who makes cuts, first off. So that's the biggest deal. And he's always, you know, sp near the lead. Um, now, Sundays, for whatever reason, he hasn't been able to close the deal. But he's always near or around the lead. So I'm going to probably play him for like a top 10 or the matchups versus his playing partner. Because sometimes what were the odds for him? So his to win, it's like ten thousand to one. So I'm definitely betting on him. So again, for every dollar I bet right there, I'm winning a hundred. So I'm definitely Drink betting on Brian. Yeah. <laughs> so where's he from? What's his background? I've seen his name a lot lately, but I don't know anything East about Coast, him. East Coast, Florida, he, I think. Yeah, he's a Florida guy. Yeah, he's a Florida okay. guy. Like like okay. Tampa, like the um, East Coast, the West Coast of Florida. West, okay. Yeah, West Coast of Florida. So, um, but yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm a sprinkle a little on him, and then. I've got my spreadsheet, JJ, because he was like, you don't even ever win any money. I'm going to share my spreadsheet at the match. He only talks about when he wins. I, I, yeah, I, I don't talk about my losses. <laughs> so, but before we get out of here, we always like to give people a tip. Obviously, since we have um, Jim with us, he'll be able to give us a great tip about the Andrew. But Taylor, let's go to you. Any tips for right now? It's getting cooler outside. Anything you want to share for the people that are listening? Well, my, my tip's a little different. So I actually just got back um, from Dallas and I played Trinity Forest where they played the Byron Nelson. And let me just tell you how incredibly difficult the greens were. Like I was hitting an iron in, everything is just right off the green. I couldn't get anything to stick. And if I did get something to stick, it was, I would barely, they said it was rolling at a 14. And wow. I'm not, it was one of the toughest greens and they had actually just punched them a couple days before and they were still rolling out of 14. Wow. It was so, insane. Uh, that was insane. pink velvet golf ball probably didn't stick very well. <laughs> <laughs> do not <laughs> take, on you the little X button. Back. Yeah. Do not <laughs> take that Taylor. Do not let him do that. <laughs> 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 With girl, girl golf, it's just so easy. You know? <laughs> Taylor, don't let him do it. Don't let it. Don't let him do it. In my career, I watched women's golf. Was when the PGA contacted me about that video they saw of Danielle Kang, and I freaking paid attention. She shot like eighty. So screw. Why screw in the ladies. world would you assume that I am playing a women's golf? Bolvik <laughs> is, is like the. the the tour sponsor of the late no golf Taylor course. don't let him do it do not let him do it Taylor do not let him <laughs> right, I'm not the, even gonna tell you what kind of and I think I that like happened that. to Bubba when he played there with the pink velvet <laughs> right. JJ what's your thoughts today um, on a on a tip or a story you want to tell 
Uh, so Monday I was doing uh, tips on the rain for a corporate outing and it dawned on me, like, I'm not going to, like, I hate doing tips on the range because like they're going to change 10 minutes before their tea time. Right. So, yeah. so everyone I walked by was like, which way are you curving it? <laughs> and they're like, I'm slicing it. So I was like, all right, here's how you hook it and give them like a fill of the club face. And I had two people already come in for lessons. Nice. They, they don't realize yeah. that your club face is 80% of direction. So if you're slicing I bet they weren't it, female. They were not, because females are scared of me. I don't know what it is. Clearly your attitude will... Um, <laughs> they probably listen to the podcast. And <laughs> um, and I don't have any more old people coming in after that last week. We were, I didn't I'm know our old. fan base was like 65 years old. I'm old. What are you talking about? Jim, do you see what we have to deal with? <laughs> hey, Jim, Jim, so so I was going to tell you it, but I didn't really give an intro on Jim. So Jim's got that like stupid sense of humor, except he's in like a nice version, and I've got the stupid sense of humor and the dumb version. I, so, I, like I, my, I, I call uh, JJ our Bill Burr. JJ is our oh, Bill Burr. Oh, I, I, I watch him on yeah. YouTube like all night now. He is so funny. I was like, I, God, so, I love this guy's great. Like so Jim, Jim, what's your tip today for people? And then at the same time, if you don't mind, could you make sure we have your social media accounts, website, where people can find more information about the company before we wrap this up? Sure. So I grew up in North Dakota and it's cold up there and it's getting cold right now. I'm in South Carolina now, but I grew up in North Dakota. So I would play hockey all winter. So I just put the clubs away. Yeah. Well, I would have to relearn the golf swing every spring. And that was just annoying. So what I recommend... You can use a golf club, but it's even better if you use an orange whip. But of course. Take of your course orange whip and swing it every day this winter if you're from a northern climate, either in the garage, in the house, if you don't have a chandelier, and swing it back and forth. Find your rhythm, but it keeps your body loose and it keeps your body moving. And if you can keep that motion, when you come back in the springtime, you'll have the footwork, you'll have the body rotation you'll have the swing and you won't have to relearn it you may have to relearn how to address a golf ball but you won't have to learn the swing so i recommend swinging every day at least three to five minutes if not more nice okay yeah. great if, 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 if there was a, a human orange whip would you say phil mickelson would be the human orange whip because <laughs> he just no. looks like he's like an orange whip when he's swinging well <laughs> his motion his motion is is very much like that he loads up all this energy and uh, yeah, it flows so yeah he would be a good uh, a good I'm, example i'm gonna say i'm gonna say phil mickelson uses orange whip every day that's why he's so good well, we have a we have footage of him at the PGA Championship this year swinging his orange whip with his I mask on. I think I saw on. that. Yeah, nice. I think nice. I saw nice. that. Nice. Yeah. All right, so yeah. where can people find you for sure? We want to make sure that, and I'm going to put this in the show notes also, but where can people find you and contact you and social media, et cetera? So all of our social media is Orange Whip Golf. You can go okay. to YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and now I'm doing TikTok. And I love TikTok <laughs> oh, because... TikTok because ever since I started Orange Whip, which is exactly 13 years ago from next week, I, um, I always wanted to use music because I associate everything with rhythm and music. Well, my buddy who would make a lot of these spots for us would say, Jim, you can't use that. There's copyright issues. Well, TikTok, there's not. Yep, so I, there's not. I, uh, yep. I have unlimited uh, ideas that I'm just getting going on. I've probably only made. Oh, I love years. it. Yeah, but I'm I think I've TikTok. seen some, aren't they like 80s themed? Usually? Yes, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a huge fan of the 80s. Is your whole house 80s themed? Well, I the house next, that. my golf rental house is, is 80s themed. I want it to feel like you're in the 80s. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun <laughs> place. I have VCR in there with a bunch of old golf videotapes. I got record player with Little River Band album. I mean, I got all the good old stuff. Nice. Well, well I've really never experienced that. Stop. <laughs> Don't let him do it. Tell him up. So thank you again. This has been um, episode 32 of the Golf Performance Group podcast. Follow us on um, Instagram at golf underscore pod. Follow us on YouTube at Golf Performance Group. Um, also, um, if you go to Orange Whip Golf, correct? Yep. Orange Whip Golf on all. Uh, media outlets and then of course um, subscribe to your favorite podcast we're also now on iHeartRadio so uh, not only are we on your Apple, your Spotify, uh, Pocket Cast we're also on iHeartRadio so like, comment, subscribe, we appreciate you listening and that's been episode 32